tell you five quick things to know about me. Um, I did start uh, my own design company. It's called InfoNoot. We design data visualization and infographics for clients all over the world. Um, some of the ones you see in social media um, are shared infographics, but a lot of our design is actually internal corporate graphics for presentations and trade shows and brochures and annual reports and that kind of thing as well. Um, I run the website coolinfographics.com where it's not my work, I mean, it's very rarely my work. It's really sharing the best designs that I can find anywhere. Sometimes it's you know from a magazine, oftentimes it's online, um, and it has a little bit of discussion as to what's new and what's different, um, and what could have been done better sometimes, that kind of thing. Um, the book is Cool Infographic. It's gonna cover everything. It's not about how to use software, it's about how to design with data. Um, so it really is tool independent. Um, talking about structuring a story and how to visualize data and how to improve your charts and how to publish stuff online. Um, I also run locally the DFW Data Visualization and Infographics Meetup Group. Uh, we have about 800 members. We meet monthly with speakers. Uh, we just had IBM speak earlier this week. Um, so I encourage all of you to um, join the group just so you get the notifications um, and get to see what kind of speakers we have coming in. And then I do teach a class at SMU on data visualization and infographics design. Um, it's a six-week class, three hours a night for six weeks. Um, the next one's going to start up in April. Um, so let's dive in. Um, really want to start with the data side. So we all are inundated with information and data, specifically online, but every part of our lives. And every single day, it continues to get worse. It gets harder and harder for you to find the kind of information you're looking for because that haystack, that pool of information out there gets bigger every day. There's a research study that says that as of uh, this latest was 2014, that we as average Americans are exposed to what they call the information equivalent of 280 newspapers per day that you have to read and figure out how much of that information applies to you and you want to do something with. It used to only be 40 back in 1986. This is why we say we are having shorter and shorter lifespans and why we say our, you know, the average American's uh, attention span is now shorter than a goldfish, um, which is nine seconds. And we can't even pay attention for nine seconds. Okay, everybody remember, pay attention to me. Look back over here. <laughs> um, and so this is a problem that we have as a society and as individuals, as consumers of information. To give us a, just a, a basis in information, um, let's talk about how much data we, we have to look at. So this yellow square represents the size of a gigabyte of data. Um, and a gigabyte is about the size of a movie off of a DVD. That's a really rough estimate of, of how much data is in a gigabyte. So I'm going to shrink that down. And when we talk about hard drives in laptops, we talk about terabytes. Right? And a terabyte is a little more than a thousand times larger than a gigabyte. So now you can see. Oh, it lost it in this presentation, okay? Or it hasn't caught up yet. Dang. <laughs> okay. So like I was saying, this purple square represents the size of a petabyte um, compared to this small red square, which is a terabyte. And if you can even see it, a single yellow pixel that represents a gigabyte, you know, the size of a movie. So this purple square, this petabyte, is a million movies. When we look at data storage, Google revealed that they were processing 20 petabytes a day back in 2008. Um, they generally don't share this kind of information, but their data team did back then. We can safely assume they do a whole lot more today. There's a, a research um, approximation that added together all of the written works of mankind in every language that's been ever written down since the beginning of recorded history, that that adds up to about 50 petabytes of data. That's everything we've ever written down as a species. However, 
Facebook's data warehouse is now up to 300 petabytes. Why would Facebook need six times the storage capacity of the entire written works of mankind? Any guesses? See if we can get it to come up. Yes, it is videos. It's videos and audio, um, all these file types and that take up a whole lot more space than text does. There we go. <laughs> Cat videos. This is why we need so much storage space. Um, and then last year, the NSA opened up this new data processing uh, facility in Utah. Um, and of course, they're not telling us how much is in there, but there were a couple different approximations that they opened it starting with 2,000 petabytes of storage, which is two billion movies, if you look back at the, the size of a gigabyte. Um, and so that's storage. This is data transfer. We, we actually move a whole lot more data across the internet. Um, in 2015, the average was about 76,000 petabytes a month of data moving across the internet. And this year is going to be closer to 92,000, probably average, and somewhere between the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, we're going to cross over 100,000 petabytes a month of data moving across the internet. So, safe to say, um, it is really hard to find information that you're actually looking for and understand it and have time to comprehend it and read it and figure out what it is. It gets harder every single day because that pile of data gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what do we do, right? So we're designing communication. We design data visualizations. We have to tap into a few advantages we have as a species. Number one, we are visual creatures. Um, I've seen research from 60% to 90% of our brain processing power is dedicated to your sight to vision, to your spatial sense, to your uh, visual memory. Um, we are visual creatures and we want to tap into that. So you are a pattern recognition machine. In fact, you are the best pattern recognition machine on the planet. You can see this if you were to come across it in real life. And within nanoseconds, less than a second, you know that your life is in danger. Right, you'll see this lion hiding in the grass and you'll notice that it's a break of the pattern in the grass and understand what that pattern is, and, but you don't have to pull out a guidebook and try to figure out what is that shape I see in the grass and figure out what a lion is. You can figure all that out in nanoseconds and you're the best um, machine, like I said, on the planet to figure out patterns and you can recognize them very, very quickly. The other thing we have the advantage of um, is what's called the picture superiority effect. And what the picture superiority effect tells us is that if you just listen to me and I don't show you anything, if you're just reading text in an article or a book, three days from now on Monday, you're only gonna remember 10% of that information. But if I can tie that information into the visual part of your brain, if I can tie that concept or that thought or um, that data into an image, that actually taps into that, that visual cortex in the visual part of your brain, um, that three days later on Monday, you are likely to remember up to 65% of that information. And when you're communicating information, right, you're doing it because you actually want people to remember it and do something with whatever it is you're, you're conveying to them. It might be informative, you might be persuading them to do something, um, but you certainly want them to remember it so that you actually change their behavior. You see this around all the time. Anybody have motivational posters in their offices? Um, they tie a, a, a pretty big image to a very simple concept. Um, and the idea is that the combination there, using that big photo, is going to um, remain in your memory and actually change your behavior. This is actually not a motivational poster. This is a demotivational poster. If you've never seen despair.com, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, if you're cons consistently bad, don't tell anybody how consistent you are. Um, but that's the idea, it's the tie image. Now we're surrounded by visual information. Not everything you see is a data visualization or an infographic. Um, so we have to make the distinction between the two. Um, this, um, in the top piece, there we go, is a chart. This is what I call a data visualization. This is a visual representation of data. There's more than 80,000 data points that are represented in this chart for the last, I think, 75 years of the history of the stock market. Um, so this is what we call a data visualization. There is one step up that I call info art. Um, so this is, designed based on data, but it has no functional purpose other than looking pretty. Um, so this is a poster, you can buy these, they're fabulous. 
um, that represents the first 1,000 digits of the mathematical constant pi. Um, and so you'll see the arcs around the outside of the circle represent the 10 digits 0 through 9. And there is one continuous line that starts at number 3, goes 3.14159, and off for 1,000 digits. Now it looks great, makes a great poster, but you're not going to say, man, I need to know the 300th digit of pi. I'm going to go look at that poster and figure it out, right? It's not a poster that you're actually going to be able to use for a functional purpose. And then we have infographics. And so the way I sort of explain infographics is that it takes data visualization as a tool, and we use data visualization along with illustration, along with text, along with layout, um, to tell a story to the audience. Um, this one has 29 different data visualizations in it. Um, so data visualization is a design tool that we use um, to create infographics. So the thing to remember is that when you visualize data, your audience will understand it faster, and they're going to be more likely to remember it. That's why we visualize data, because it's that effective way of communicating. And it doesn't have to be this huge 10,000 line spreadsheet. Data could be a process, it could be a concept, or it could be survey results or research data, that kind of thing. Online, we also face those short attention spans. Uh, we have what's called the five second rule. Most times when people come to a website and look at a data visualization or an infographic, they're only there for about five or 10 seconds and that's it. So you've got to be able to communicate your message so fast that they're not going to read it top to bottom. Your message has to get across so that when they move on, they still actually walk away with your message. Um, so at the beginning of every design process, we talk about what's the key message. What is that one thing you want your audience to walk away with so that we make sure that that's the thing we hit them over the head with? They don't have to read the whole infographic, but if they walk away with that message, we've succeeded. So in this case, um, where does Google make their money? Um, starts with this stack bar chart at the top and says 97% of Google's revenue comes from advertising. Has this big, beautiful pie chart of the top most expensive keywords you can buy through Google AdWords. Um, and as long as you understand that Google makes their money from advertising, mission accomplished. You don't need to know that number, I think it's 18 is rehab, and number six is lawyer, and you know that's details that a very minute part of your audience is actually gonna dig in and look at. Um, but it reinforced the, the initial concept, which is where is Google making their money? When you visualize data, um, it's really important that you understand that you are actually are providing context and meaning to your audience. Um, if you don't provide that context when you design data visualizations, they're going to bring their own context and you have no control over that whatsoever. Every person in your audience is going to bring a different frame of reference and a different context to the information that you share. Um, and to do that, you have to share more than one value. Um, one value, one stat, one number all by itself is really hard to understand. I can show you this number, three billion global internet users today, um, and I can put it on a really big font, on a really big projected screen. Um, but just by doing that alone, you still have no context. Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is that supposed to be a large number or a small number? You don't have any context, and every one of you is going to look at 3 billion and compare it to something you already know. I don't know what you're going to compare it to because it's all going to be different. Um, so I have to tell designers often that big fonts are not <laughs> data visualizations. Okay, making the number big doesn't help. <laughs> You may want to do it, but make sure you tie it to a visual. So here's an example of an infographic um, that lays out how many users there are in all the top social media platforms. Um, from Facebook at 1.4 billion, down to Vine at only 40 million. Um, they're all the same size boxes, they're all the same size fonts. Um, you visually have no frame of reference that which numbers or values are bigger than others. You have to take the time and read them and compare them in your head. It's actually more difficult that way. Here's another one you may have seen. This is a series. I think they're up to 4.0 now about what happens in a minute on the internet. Um, and all these fonts are different. All these font sizes are different. Um, there's actually no correlation between the font sizes and the data in this one. Um, it's all about how big can the font be made to fit into that pie segment um, around the circle. It actually becomes very difficult and confusing for readers to go through and understand these numbers. Creative warnings sent me this beautiful pamphlet about an intro to creative mornings and what we are and who we are and how many chapters we have and how we're growing and stuff like that. Um, but this is an example of the same idea where all the design is big numbers. So I'll pick on creative mornings for a moment. You know, 104 global chapters is the biggest number on the page, but it's the smallest actual number. Um, and so there's no visual frame of reference. You as the audience, you have to read each one of those numbers and decide for yourself, is that a big number, is that not a big number? 
You can't visualize a number all by itself in a chart. A bar chart with only one bar, again, doesn't give you any frame of reference. Um, so you as the designer, when you choose that, you have to understand that you're bringing not only meaning and understanding and context to your audience, but you are actually bringing in a little bit of bias as well. So if I compare 3 billion global internet users to the total population of the planet at 7 billion, it's you know a little more than a third, not quite a half. We've got a good chunk, we've got a long way to go. Um, and you create that meaning because you, of that second number, that number you've chosen to compare it to. If I go the other way and compare 3 billion to the a uh, little over 300 million total population of the US, that's more than nine times every man, woman, and child in the US. Now that three billion is a really big number. Um, and so you frame that uh, context, that meaning, that understanding of the numbers when you choose what numbers to include in your data visualization. Um, and real quick, I, I talk about this sometimes. If you mix things, and you'll see this a lot in uh, news articles or infographics, some data will be visualized and then some data will be in text by itself. Um, your eye is drawn to the visual, so you naturally will interpret any number they visualized as more important than the numbers that were just in text alone. So if you're going to share data, in my opinion, if it, if it warrants being included in your design, in your presentation, in your infographic, it warrants being visualized and taking the time to visualize it. We try to use pre-attentive attributes. Anybody familiar with pre-attentive attributes? Is that familiar to a number of people here? So pre-attentive attributes. Um, are visual things that your brain can process faster than anything else. You can see different colors, oops, it's not going up there. Different colors, different shapes, a different position. You can see that in nanoseconds and doesn't require your higher brain function. Um, and so it actually helps you and speeds how quickly you understand information if we take advantage of these pre-attentive attributes as designers. So quick exercise, I want you to count the number of fours in here, not including the one in the title. Raise your hand, don't shout it out yet, but raise your hand once you have a count of the number of fours. Raise them high. Anybody yet? Seconds are ticking by. How many fours are there? Come on. Okay, give me some answers. What do you got? Seven, eight. Any other numbers? Nine. Okay, so pre-attentive attributes uh, allow me as the designer to make it easier for you to see and understand that information. If I make them bigger, um, you can see that we have eight fours. If I um, change the color, or in this case, opacity, I make all the other numbers fade into the background. It's really easy for you to find those fours. Um, and these are visual things that we can do not only in charts, but in text. Um, we can use color to highlight um, all eight fours in the mix. And you know what, um, call outs, I can actually put use arrows or circles or anything to point them out and point out that important piece of information in a data visualization. Some people even like to com combine them all together. So you have color, you have opacity, and the circles all at once. Um, it is really important to get them right. All the good things about data visualization, it's faster to understand, it's easier to remember, hurt you just as strongly if you mess up your data visualization. That's not what 80% looks like. That's not what 20% looks like. <laughs> The, the donuts there don't match the data and you will shoot your credibility in the foot so, so fast. Um, pie charts, for some reason, are so hard. <laughs> pie charts have to add up to 100%. Okay, it's the golden rule of pie charts. <laughs> and it happens all the time, you will see it. You know, once you start looking for it, you will see it all over the place where, you know, the wrong set of data was applied to the wrong chart style. Um, here's one from Nielsen, they measure smartphone market share, and this is called a tree map. And in a tree map, each of these rectangles is sized to match its value. These are percentages of market share. And the overall, the big uh, rectangle is 100%. Um, and you'll notice pretty quickly that Apple in yellow in the middle at 34% is about the same size as Blackberry, which is only 9%, right? The data's right, but the tree map is completely wrong, right? And Nielsen, here's what it looks like when they corrected it. They had to republish this a couple weeks later because they updated all the values in text but never actually updated the chart itself. Um, and you can't see it. So we'll keep going. Dang that. Um, so these are what we call false visualizations. Um, and I will attribute that mostly to just um, accidents, mistakes, using the wrong chart style, using the wrong data visualization, um, it's, there's no malicious intent, it's just 
people using charts and, and data viz design incorrectly. Um, the big one, I don't know if this will catch up or not, we'll just keep going. Um, the big one is circles. Um, if you're gonna size any shapes, but specifically circles, um, it is really important that you calculate the area of the shapes, not the width and the height of the shapes, which is what all the design software asks for. Um, it makes a huge difference. Because what you see on a two-dimensional page, good, a cut off, um, is the area of an object, a two-dimensional object for a one-dimensional value. So if you want to actually show some value that's three times the size of the first value, you need to calculate the area, triple the area, and then back into what should that diameter be. If you triple the diameter, you actually make a circle that's nine times as large. This happens all the time. This happened last week. I don't know if I can get it to come up, but CNN published one last week that did exactly this. Um, the map of ISIS attacks used a size of one circle on the map to be one attack, and triple the diameter was the size of three attacks, when in fact the map was actually showing nine times the attacks. There you go. So CNN published this just last week. We see this all the time. And so you can see on this map, one incident is only one third the diameter, and three times the incidence is now triple, so that the bigger circle, the three incidents, is actually nine times as large. So the correct way to do it, if you want to design showing the size of objects to represent you know, proportional sizes, is to calculate the area. You actually have to set up a spreadsheet, do some math before you take those diameters and go back into your design software and size everything appropriately. Um, don't ever design a chart like this. <laughs> There's so many things wrong with this. Um, but the big one, the point I want to make is this chart legend, this color key over on the side, actually makes it harder for your audience to read this information because they have to look back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to figure out your information. Defaults, when you get them in Office, you know, PowerPoint or Excel, they're always going to have that color key legend over on the side um, by default. But you, as the designer, you want to get rid of that. You want to make your chart easier to read, and you can do that right in, say, PowerPoint or Excel if that's what you're working with. You don't have to go to an outside design software. Um, in this case, all I did was eliminate the chart legend, put the data names down in the data themselves, and I threw some icons on top of the chart to represent the different age groups in the population of the US. Um, it just puts it all in one field of view and makes it that much easier for your audience to understand that data. Don't use the templates. You have to start with a template, but you shouldn't end with a template. Um, the templates are their best guess at something that might be generic because they don't know your data, they don't know your audience, they don't know who you're trying to communicate with. It's up to you to sort of tap into that. Um, so you can take this one chart, again, don't even leave Excel or PowerPoint, um, and improve it by getting rid of that color key, getting rid of the grid lines, that's just visual noise, um, coloring the, the data to actually match the logos of the companies that your data set's talking about. Um, you can make a really nice looking chart and then use that in a blog post or an infographic or a presentation or anywhere else. Um, and you didn't have to go manually create a chart somewhere else in design software. Um, and once you get into more complicated data, this is the default chart uh, for skin cancer rates in Australia compared to the US, Germany, and the UK. The default chart is so confusing to read, right? But it only takes about 10 steps to take this chart and turning it into a chart that actually tells a better story. And again, using those pre-attentive attributes, um, we want to color the data set that I want to attract your attention and where I'm trying to tell my story. It may or may not catch up. Um, but the idea is to get rid of the clutter, take anything that's just comparative information or secondary information and make that gray, make that black, make that another color and make the color help your data stand out because that's the data you're trying to tell a story with. Yeah, that one's just not gonna catch up. Um, be different, um, and when I say by be different, most people get stuck in the big three pie charts, bar charts, and line charts. Um, and there are hundreds of ways to visualize information. Um, I, as a practice, and if it would come up, it'd be beautiful. Um, but I've made a sheet, just as a cheat sheet, for the class that I teach at SMU that has 20 different ways to visualize percentages. Just if you're working with percentages, there are 20 different ways that you can visualize that information. You start with a, part, a, pie, chart, sorry, a pie chart, but you wanna mix it up, not only because it's gonna be different and more memorable to your audience, but also because you're gonna find a different visual style 
that's going to make that information easier to understand or more meaningful. Um, pie charts just make your data look like everybody else's data. Um, so I will wrap it up. Um, my book, there is a free chapter online for you to download if you'd like to um, at coolinfographics.com slash book. Um, you're welcome to download a free chapter. We uh, have a local DFW meetup group for DF data visualization and infographics. You're all welcome to join. Um, it's at bit.ly DFW data viz. It's also DFW data viz on the meetup site. Um, so I will open it up to questions and wrap up the presentation there.